April tour to India sometime either late, sometime either late this year or early next year, where we will take uh, a group of people to India for a week uh, just to uh, provide a physical observance of what's going on at, on the ground rather than the virtual tours. Okay. Just thought uh, in this session, initially, I will just introduce you to uh, India Avenue, firstly, and then the grassroots tour in this virtual format. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to talk about the three aspects of our philosophy um, and what we've espoused since we started. We, uh, our views are that India will always be a high growth region. Uh, relative to the rest of the world from a country perspective. Um, and we feel that is because of the underlying fundamentals that all of you appreciate. Uh, we also feel based on our evidence of having invested in these markets and observance of active management and its uh, capabilities in the region that uh, Indian capital markets continue to be relatively inefficient and the best way to extract um, the best results out of this market uh, is through active management. And we also think the third aspect uh, being that locally based investment managers are likely to deliver better long term returns compared to those who are operating in locations like San Francisco, New York, London, um, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, who are trying to capture the best of India amongst a broader mandate. So we think if you are trying to access India, uh, the best way to do it is with depth and via a single country allocation to generate the best of uh, the growth that can come from the region. Uh, India Avenue today manages about uh, 75 to $80 million of assets. Uh, we have our core fund, which has about 50 to 70 stocks uh, with a growth style in aggregate uh, it's advised upon by three advisors who are all based in India that we have selected uh, and have given a mandate. We aggregate the advice and build a portfolio out of that. Um, typically, the fund will be underweight the top 10 stocks by market cap and will uh, have a exposure to a lot of uh, tomorrow's you know, uh, top 50 stocks, which are currently in mid or small cap space. So we have typically a split of about one third large cap, one third mid and one third small. Uh, the product is Lonsec recommended, has been for the last four years and is available on several investment platforms in Australia. Um, it is benchmark unaware running a tracking error in history of around 5% and is available for high net worth wholesale and retail. We've launched a fund recently uh, which is uh, in January this year, that is a high conviction uh, fund, only has 15 to 20 stocks. There's only one advisor for this fund called Oldbridge Capital Management, uh, who's uh, established a very strong track record over investing in Indian equities over the last 20 years. Uh, they apply a capital cycle approach to investing. Uh, they're looking for growth companies. All their companies are profitable and growing and ideally they want to buy them at a point in the cycle which is more favorable from a valuation perspective. The fund only plays three to five themes and has almost 100% active share. It's appropriate for high net worth or sophisticated investors only, uh, and uh, it will not be seeking a rating or seeking to be on platforms. Uh, the difference in unit pricing is monthly versus daily. Okay, so that's, that's the two funds today. Uh, if I push forward, I'll just quickly highlight uh, some of the current positioning of India, and I'll run through this quickly. Uh, GDP growth has slowed slightly to 5.4. That was uh, as a result of some of the slowdown being experienced globally. Uh, India was post-COVID running at a rate of about 8 to 9% which we think it can resume if uh, what we're seeing today is somewhat transitory rather than structural. Um, CPI is around 6%, which is at the upper end of the band. Um, cash rates have been retained at 4% because the central bank has been pro-growth. 
Um, from a current account perspective, we all know that India tends to import a significant part of its oil requirement, over 80%. So rising oil prices and sustained high oil prices uh, does create a problem from a current account perspective. One of the positive aspects of that is India has built up a significant amount of forex reserves, which is able to help it defend the currency if required and uh, manage macroeconomics of India in a much better fashion than it could do if it didn't have the reserves uh, that are available today. Uh, from a PMI perspective, India still is in a growth uh, phase and we are expecting, we'll hear from that in session five, a pickup in the CAPEX cycle at some point over the next couple of years. From a currency perspective, we can see that the Australian dollar has been quite strong relative to most currencies around the world, and that's the same with the rupee, but broadly over the longer term, it hasn't been a substantial uh, shift from when we started the fund. Uh, we are finding the Aussie uh, showing um, some additional strength more lately in line with the terms of trade in Australia and commodity prices. However, in the long term, the Indian rupee tends to be quite lowly correlated to Australian assets, and therefore Indian equities as an asset class tends to have lower correlation to Australian equities than, for example, emerging markets. Just also to illustrate India's return potential, we can see there that we put uh, one year, three year, five year, and 10 years, as well as year to date. So when you just look at it from an overall long-term return perspective, the Indian market uh, is one of the few really that can, is comparable to the US in terms of local currency returns. Uh, when we look at developed markets versus emerging markets, we can see China's influence and perhaps the weakness over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, and we can see uh, markets like Australia, Japan, Europe have had similar types of uh, returns over longer term time periods. But uh, India, you know, seems to be uh, showing fairly sustained uh, strong returns over the longer term. It's worth noting for emerging market and developed market investors. Uh, when we look at the key return drivers, we can see that Local investors have become a much bigger part of uh, the market cap of uh, India. We can see that typically um, it was driven by global investors. Global investors, when they have exited more recently, uh, that has been offset by additional investment, um, which is more sustainable and structural uh, increase in local investment. Uh, so, you know, for the first time, we saw that foreign investors were net sellers uh, in, in last year, first time in five years, uh, local investors have sort of been able to withstand that uh, by, you know, buying into the local markets. And we also saw from a sectoral perspective that typical winners of the last decade, like finance and consumer stocks, didn't necessarily win in the last year. And we had a bit of a change in market pattern when, where we saw mid and small cap stocks outperforming uh, the large cap stocks. So it has been a, a, a bit of a pivot time in markets post COVID. Uh, and another important aspect to bring to you is that, you know, when we look at the long term, MSCI India has uh, well and truly outpaced emerging markets over the last 10 years. The difference has been significant, uh, which reflects the fundamentals of India and also the higher ROEs of India and the lower volatility of earnings. India is also becoming more important from a global perspective and is now close to 3% of world market cap and rising. And uh, after a weak period of earnings over the last decade, uh, we've certainly seen uh, you know, that start to change and ROEs and earnings growth starting to pick up uh, and potentially heading towards the next capital cycle. Uh, in terms of our investor base, we've seen Australian investors typically prefer exposure to India via emerging market funds or Asia funds. Single country in, uh, investing hasn't been significant or sought after, given there's a lack of transparency into individual regions or countries. Um, 
the evidence, however, seems to point that EM funds don't necessarily add value through country selection. Um, and India, meanwhile, has outperformed EM at every period over the last 20 years and is also less correlated to Aussie equities and Aussie assets relative to emerging markets. So it's starting to build a case towards uh, looking at India as a regional allocation. We saw, you know, uh, two of Australia's large uh, investment consultants, Mercer and Willis Towers Watson, for the first time advocating single country investing in China via uh, partnerships with local Chinese managers. We think over the next three to five years, that journey will extend to India. Um, and today, our, our client base is roughly one third family offices, one third high net worth and directs, as well as one third financial planning clients. Uh, we anticipate that institutions are probably in line with consultant thinking, probably three to five years away from single country allocation. And finally, uh, the outlook for the decade, we think India can emerge as the third largest economy in the world if not by the end of the decade, then shortly after. Manufacturing will become far more important in India than it is today and will rise um, from 15% of GDP. Um, a significant part of that is already being illustrated through the rising exports and capability of India's manufacturing and uh, the ability to export some of that to the rest of the world. Uh, India's population will have one of the lowest dependency ratios in the world by 2030. And we're going to see a massive shift towards financialization, formalization of sectors. Uh, we're going to see also reforms leading to efficiency via productivity gains, rising GDP per capita. And we think India is already an entrepreneurial and uh, you know, tech infused uh, market. And that should allow uh, a lot of unicorns to continue to emerge with the tailwinds of scale. Um, Corporate profitability we've talked about, we'll see here in our last session why uh, that is likely to continue to rise, that's what we've experienced over the last few years. And we think certain industries will emerge as uh, in global leader status, such as in pharma, data storage, knowledge, auto and ancillaries, electronics and chemicals, where India is already globally competitive. And we think broadly India's market cap can hit 5 trillion, and be the third largest in the, in the world by country after the US and China. So it should be an exciting decade for investors uh, given these factors. Is there any questions before we, uh, before we move on to session two? Um, you can please put them in the chat box or um, unmute yourself and ask it. Just wanting to know what um, the, the lowest dependency rate, what does that mean? So dependency rate ratio essentially means the number of people uh, who are dependent versus those that are not. So under 15 and over 65, are the dependents, 15 no. to 65 are the non-dependents. So when you have a low dependency ratio, it means you have a lot of employed, employable people and relative to the people who are dependent. So China's dependency ratio bottomed out in 2010. And for the 30 years before that, they had superior growth. So as your dependency ratio bottoms out, that's when you should be experiencing the highest growth before it starts reversing. Okay, thank you. No problems. If there are no more questions, then we can end the session. Uh, it's probably time for one question, but 